it, it's really interesting because you, you mentioned that this is not just a story about the post-war period, because mm -hmm. obviously we have all the veterans that then kind of have to readjust, but it's, it's a wartime story. And yeah. what really struck me when I was going through your first chapter there was this creation of the Veteran Reserve Corps. And yeah. in part, I'm kind of curious, why did they create this? What was the goal of this unit or, as you point out, units, really? Yeah, right. It, it ends up being, um, it ends up consisting of two different battalions, right? First battalion mm -hmm. and second battalion. So it is technically like two units. Um, that's such an interesting question. Why did they set out to create this this unit in the first place is actually... Um, in a way sort of simple and in a way kind of complicated, which is the story that I tell right. in the first chapter. Um, because on its face, um, the simplest way of, of explaining why they created it was because there was a looming manpower shortage. And they were, the Union Army was really concerned, the War Department was really concerned about the fact that um, they felt like the Army was, was shrinking. Right. This is it's founded in the spring of 1863, and it's at this moment when they're finding other ways to expand the ranks. Right. This mm -hmm. is when um, we the, the draft is implemented. It's when the USCT is first created. So they're trying to find different ways to make sure that the army is staying as strong as possible. Right. Um, and right around the same time, there's this kind of conversation about well. If we're, if we're finding these other ways of bringing people into the army, one of the unsolved problems, um, or one of the problems that people aren't even paying attention to is the fact that we're just discharging people, right? Like, or um, if they're wounded, uh, and by we're just discharging people, I mean, if, when someone is wounded or sick, we just like, okay, bye, and we discharge them, right? Because those decisions were made entirely by surgeons. So surgeons, and they didn't really even have like strict guidelines on who to discharge and when and that kind of thing. So it's just kind of arbitrary on their part, right? They, they had that decision completely. But also on top of that, we have large populations of soldiers who are staying in hospitals to convalesce. So they're staying in the larger hospitals in places like Annapolis and Alexandria and Philadelphia and, and Washington. Um, and they're, they're, they are still recuperating, right? They're, they're convalescing, but they're also not acutely sick anymore. Like they can kind they can still kind of get around. So they're causing a lot of problems, right? Like they're drinking and carousing and, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't look good for the army, right? Like all of these kind of wayward half injured soldiers kind of causing problems in Washington, DC. Um, and so there's an attempt to make use of their labor by help having them, you know, clean up around the hospitals or having them work as hospital stewards or something. But even that causes some concern because they're too good at that work. <laughs> if that makes sense, right? They're kind sure. of concerned that if they have them do this work that is very gendered, right? It's kind of yeah. women's work. It's also racialized. It's work yeah. that um, contraband and, and black um, men and women are doing around hospitals, that that's kind of sapping the masculine energy of these mm. soldiers, right? That they're, yeah. they're kind of too good at it and it's ruining them. And so the, the, what is initially called the Invalid Corps, it's initially named the Invalid Corps, is an attempt to solve all of those problems. We can keep people in the army. We can keep them busy instead of convalescing in Washington. And we can continue to benefit from their labor, right? We can keep them doing those things that need to be done, which means that we can free up men that are healthy for field duty, right? So it's like solving a series of problems. Instead of having healthy, able-bodied, quote unquote, able-bodied men, um, guarding prisons, for instance, now we can have the Invalid Corps do that because that's something that they are capable of doing, but they're not capable of hard marching and mm -hmm. frontline service, right? So that's one justification for it. The War Department, however, um, you see this 
in conversations in the OR of, um, you know, uh, the, I think it's the Provost Marshal, um, James Fry is writing about this at one point saying, okay, it has this practical reason, but it also has this cultural reason. Um, maybe cultural isn't even quite the right, the right word, but almost like a, 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 a figurative reason for mm -hmm. it, right? Which is that um, we are, we, he says something to the effect of, we know that disability equals dependency. Mm -hmm. Like once you are disabled, we know that that means that, especially for men, that's a bad thing because men are supposed to be providers. They're supposed mm -hmm. to take care of the people in their life. And now because they're disabled, they're going to become dependent mm -hmm. on people rather than being the independent men that we expect them to be. And if we discharge these disabled men, they're just going to become kind of emasculated charity cases. So this is going to give them something to do, something to be proud of. Now, what he doesn't say is that he's not really going to give them a choice, <laughs> right? Like they right. didn't really, if, unless they were an amputee, you just got sent to the invalid core, mm -hmm. um, transferred without your opinion going into it at all. And then you were kind of told, see, this is helping you, <laughs> right? Which is kind of, kind of funny. Um, amputees had the choice. They could say they had, their sacrifice was significant enough that they could say yes or no. And many of them do say yes, but, um, but yeah, so it has that kind of reasoning behind it. And then if you dig even one layer deeper, it becomes clear that as long as they kept those men in the invalid core and didn't discharge them, they weren't paying pensions. I was so, going to ask how much of an economic kind of factor plays yeah. into this too, where you don't have to hire potentially a worker with salary because exactly. you already have to soldier on on payroll versus right. obviously also the pension that you don't have to pay yet. Right. And so the pensions are of course promised to these soldiers yeah. after 1862. Um, and so the, you know, there's a very, again, another pr very practical reason for this, which mm -hmm. is that if we release them, we have to pay them a pension. If we keep them, yes, we're going to be paying them, but we're going to be extracting labor in exchange for that. So there's, there's a number of reasons why the invalid core gets created in the first place. It seems very capitalistic there in this kind of, yeah. in the thinking of, well, let's extract as much labor as we can out of them as long as we can. Yes, yeah, exactly. 